Thank you. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about how to optimize generic programs through inlining. This, um, I'm kind of happy that Tom gave his talk for me, because he already introduced uh, many things I'm going to talk about. On the other hand, he already talked about many things I'm going to talk about. <laughs> so, but I'm still going to try to put my talk in perspective of what he already said. Um, what is the problem? Um, generic programming, data type generic programming is really nice, it allows you to reduce code duplication and save a lot of time, but often these programs are slower than the performance you get if you write them specifically for each data type. This happens often because there are conversions to representation types and these do not get eliminated by the compiler. No one wants a performance penalty, so we should try to fix this. Uh, so the outline for this talk, I'm going to start with an example how you can do enumeration on natural numbers, PM on natural numbers. Um, and I'm going to kind of have like a toy generic representation for natural numbers and how we can optimize those more or less by hand. And then we take a look at the specific library for generic programming, namely generic deriving, how we can enumerate, how we can do enumeration in that library, and then how we can do ultimate, how, how, how how can we convince the compiler to perform optimization for enumeration in that specific library? And that's how the concluding works. I'm, be, I'm going to be talking about GHC. This is all, uh, well, generic deriving is a, a library that is now in GHC, even though it started in UHC, and the optimization techniques that it applied to GHC only, because as Tom mentioned, UHC doesn't really do much. Um, okay, so. Uh, how can you enumerate? First, why am I talking about enumeration? Because most examples of generic programming that you'll see are going to be like equality or show. Enumeration is slightly trickier because it's a producer. It doesn't consume data, it generates data. So on the paper there's also a story about consumers, but producers tend to be harder, and here I'm just focusing on the harder case. Um, we assume we have some sort of um, interleave thing that just takes elements from the first and from the second list alternatively to produce a result list. So if you have that, you can just say, um, in original natural, well, it's either the zero or it's the successor of recursively enumerating the other naturals. Of course, here you don't really need interleaving because there's only one thing on the left. But in general, you might think that your data types will have multiple cases and there might be recursive calls on both of them, so that they might be both infinite, so you want some kind of fair interleaving in there. Um, now, let's start with our simulation of a generic representation of natural numbers. Um, so, naturals are a choice, which we encode with the either data type, between the base case, zero, which we encode as a singleton, or, uh, again, a natural number. We use a shallow representation here, so in the recursive positions we're going to have naturals and not representations of naturals. This is essential so that things like these conversion functions are not recursive. And since they're not recursive, they're far easier to optimize because you're not afraid that you will run into infinite inline. Um, so then we need conversion functions to and from. Actually, we don't need from because this is a producer, so you're never going to need to convert from naturals. But you need to convert from the representation to the actual naturals. And that's just pattern matching on the left unit, sending it to a zero. On the right hand, to the <coughs> making it into a successor. With this in hand, um, to get enumeration on these representations, we now need enumeration on units and sums. Enumerating units is very simple, there's just one. Um, enumerating choices, you, well, get an enumeration for the left and one for the right. You basically apply left to the ones on the left, apply right to the ones on the right, and you interleave them. Um, so now we can get our enumeration on the representable naturals, um, because they are just a choice between the units, or the recursive uh, occurrence of representable naturals. And from there, we can get enumeration on actual naturals by simply mapping our conversion function to nat over this list of representable naturals. So we now have 
two enumerations for naturals, hopefully they're the same. One is the one that we uh, started with, uh, the very simple one shown on the previous slide. And the other one is this one that goes through this complicated representation. Um, this is how generic programming generally works. Functions operate on the representation, and what we want now is to make them as look as if they are just written specifically for each data type. So, how can we do that for this particular case? Let's start with enumnat from rep, so on the representation, and try to uh, make it into our type-specific enumeration for naturals. So, uh, we start with a map. Yeah, we start with a map over the representation. Let's start by applying the definition of the enumeration on representable naturals. That's just the enum plus with units and enum nuts from rep on the right. We then apply the, the definition of an enum plus, which is mapping left and mapping right with the uh, things that leave in the middle. Now we can also apply the definition of enum u, so that's just the singleton list. And uh, now we can start doing something more interesting. So here we have map applied to a, a list with a single element. So we can just kind of apply the definition of map there and replace that by just left singleton. Um, now we're more or less done here on the left, but to make some progress on the right, um, we can't make any more progress without dealing with this guy here. So continuing with what we have on top, we basically need to send, distribute this map over the interleaving operation. And that's actually given to us by the free theorem of this interleave operator. Because it will just tell you from its side that uh, mapping a function over an interleave is the same as mapping the function first of, over both sides and then interleaving. Strangely enough, we're going to use the duplication of a map as an optimization because this will lead us to later finding out that we can remove things. So now we just shoot as a map. We have a map to NAT on the left and a map to NAT on the right. We go on. We uh, use the same trick. And here on the left, we have a map applied to a single element list. So we just inline it. Um, and now we see here two NAT applied to something. We can just inline it. And two NAT is a case analysis of a left or a right case. So if we apply a case of constant, because we know that it's a left, we're going to get directly the zero on the left. On the right, we first we see a map applied to a map. We can fuse these two maps by using the Ponto composition law. And then we get a single map of two nets composed with right. And if we now inline or replace two nets by its definition, uh, then it's a right, so we can perform the case analysis, and that rewrites directly to the successor constructor. And we're done. This function here is a type-specific function on naturals, and there's no more sums, units, anything. It's fully type-specific. So now we're going to see how we can do this in the concrete setting of a library for generic programming, because it was kind of a toy example. Um, there are extra complications when you put in a generic programming library around it. Um, and we're going to see how the compiler can be forced to do it instead of us by hand. Um, I'm using the generic deriving library. It comes with UHC and GHC. Um, there's a lot of detail that I can't cover, but you can basically see this as um, these are the representation types, things that you're going to represent your data types with. There's a sum, a product, a unit, and a constant, which we basically used to tag recursion. Um, the conversions to and from are encapsulated in a type class. So, for instance, natural numbers could have an instance of generic. This type family will encode its representation as a sum between a unit and again a natural number. And these will be the conversions to uh, from the National number to the representation and the other way around. First, we need enumeration on these representation types. Well, this is going to look very much like uh, what we just done before, uh, only that we use a type class for this. But basically, this is the case for units. The case for constants, um, 
we would call another class. So we basically have two classes, one for the representation, one for the base types. So this is indirect recursion in a way. Sums and products, well, sums use interleaving as before. For products, we need a form of diagonalization. Again, the details are not important, just some form of diagonalization so that you make sure that you will eventually produce every value of the data type. Um, and now we can uh, finally uh, say how enumeration is done on user data types. Um, we just provide a default implementation that says, oh, enumeration is just applied on the representation and then you apply a conversion function to it. Things like integers and base types can have ad hoc instances, so not generic but special in a way. And uh, here I show this, but it could as well just be naturals. For these, you just need to give an empty instance head, and they are going to use the generic default over there. So, this is how you write enumeration in, um, in generic deriving. Now, what do we have to do so that the compiler will? perform the steps that we have performed when doing our optimization by hand. Um, I'm basically focusing on three things. We, we've used inlining, or applying the definition of. That's just replacing a function with its definition. You have to be careful to avoid uh, non-termination, and GHC does this by not inlining recursive functions. Uh, it's called <coughs> code duplication, so your code will load up in space, so GHC tends to avoid doing it for large functions, but sometimes we really want to do it anyway, so there are uh, pragmas that you can put attached to functions to say, ignore whatever heuristics you have, just trust me and do inline this function. Um, so this pragma will just say inline function add, and you can uh, optionally give it a phase number. We'll see why this is important later. Um, we also use the um, free theorems and functor laws, the way we can encode this in GHC is by using rewrite rules. So you can write things like this, which say, um, if you ever see a map of a function applied to the interleave of A and B, then please replace it by a map on the left and a map on the right. Um, there's, uh, the matching is very simple here, so you cannot expect um, more than just syntactic matching, nearly. Um, as has pointed out, there is no, no checking for that these things actually mean the same. You're free to write whatever you want here. Uh, so it's your responsibility that they're actually equivalent. And there's also no confluence checking, so if you want to make the compiler loop, you can. Um, so basically, it's, we have to be careful with writing these things. Um, we also need optimization of case statements. We use this in our derivation. Um, things like case of constants, so if you're doing case analysis on something that you already know what it is, then you can just replace it by uh, the result of the case on that branch. Case of case, Tom also covered. If you have two cases, then you can kind of, this is a, this is a simpler case where the E2 is equivalent to this one, so you can just replace it directly by a case that matches uh, E1 to E3. Uh, these, optimizations, these optimizations of case statements are all in GHC already, so we don't need to do anything special for them. Because they're useful uh, for all programs in general. Um, so, what do we do? We want to make sure that all the branches of the generic functions are in line, so we attach inline pragmas to the unit case, the product <coughs> case, some case, etc. And we also want to make sure that the conversions to and from are in line. However, we typically want them to be inlined after the generic function has been inlined, because if they're inlined at the same time, you can have some cases of like partial fusion and partial optimization that prevents the later um, complete fusion that you want. So we add this um, phase to say, do we only on phase one and afterwards? It starts with phase two and goes to phase one. So you say, on phase two, you're going to do the function, the generic function, and on phase one, you're going to do the conversion. Okay, so how does the code looks like, the um, generated core code for enumeration on naturals with the inline pragmas? So uh, core is a very simple um, system app like language. Um, what we get is a map of two, so okay, there's already something amiss here. 
over something that is a uh, um, sum, so still a generic representation. But it's a map over our interleave operator, so of course we need to add this free theorem of interleave, so we add it as a rule. Now we get something better. We start by already having the interleaving, so two choices. And then um, on the right in particular, we have a map of something um, applied to a map again. So we need something else that we also used before, which is the map fusion rule. If we have a map applied to a map, you can just replace it by a map to the composition of the functions. Um, now we're getting close to what we actually want. So uh, we have a choice, and here on the right we are having a map successor of what we started with, so that's good. We're just not done on the left because we have map two to, well, a single element list. So um, we need this other rule that we also used. Um, actually, we used definition of map, but GC will not inline map because it's a recursive function. So we need kind of this special case that says if you have a map, apply to a single element list, just get rid of the map and apply the function directly. With this last rule in place, then this is the code that you see generates. And as you see, that's just either zero or map successor. No more pluses or twos or anything. So we're done. Um, and that's it for what I wanted to show you basically. In the paper, I also show uh, generic <coughs> quality. That's a relatively simpler, um, simpler example where you need less rewrite rules. And I also show you um, how to enum enumeration on lists. Lists are only slightly more complicated because um, on the cons case you have two arguments, so products come into play. Products didn't come into play at all here, just sums. But the case for products uses diagonalization and basically then need the rewrite rule for distributing the map over the diagonalization. Um, and benchmark results, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to show you any fancy graphs because there's no point. They just show that this is the performance of the type specific one, this is the generic one without optimizations, and this is the generic one with optimizations. I mean, you've seen the core code, it's just the type specific one, so there's no surprise that the performance is exactly um, as good as type specific. So, generic functions don't have to be slow, and GC already has all the machinery in it. We don't need to do anything extra, we just need to compel it to do it what it should be doing. However, of course, I'm hiding a lot of things. I'm not, not, not hiding, but it's tricky to get these things right. And in particular, things like phases that you you should only do this after that, or it takes a lot of tinkering and um, looking at source code for hours and trying to find out what's happening. And, uh, so, um, because these optimizations interfere with each other, it's uh, hard to give these general yeah, guidelines that will make it work in all cases. Um, so, yeah, there's still a lot of... Uh, someone has to be looking at this code and writing these uh, inline fragments and rewrite rules. But hopefully the final user doesn't have to see anything of this and will just get efficient uh, generic functions. Um, future work? We can automate these, the generation of these inline fragments. However, the rewrite rules, uh, it's definitely not clear how to automate those because these are free theorems, and uh, well, they have two directions, of course. It's not always clear in which direction you want to apply them, um, things like that. And this works for generic deriving and other approaches that are using a sum of products representation at the type level. However, if you have things like uniplate, SYB, then I don't think these techniques can be applied, and you will need some other forms, uh, some other techniques. Thank you for your attention. Other questions? Mr. Nicholas? So, um, around slide 20 or so, you talked about um, using the free, the free theorem for maps to sort of duplicate some work, which was then to be fused um, afterwards. Um, yeah. Well, it's the the one for the free theorem of the interleaf. Sure. Yeah. Um, presumably, if the fusion doesn't happen, we want to get rid of that duplicated map. Is that something that can be done? Is it worth doing that in a separate phase? Have you looked into that? Yeah, it's, it's hard in general, right? Because 
something else might happen in the meantime. But you could you could have a rule. Rules can also take uh, phases. So you could say apply this one and up to up to the last phase. And on the last phase, you can have the reverse rule that says, oh, if there's still these two maps, no, that's not a good idea. Bring them back. Something fails. And, uh, yeah. So you can do that. But if something else happens in the meantime, it might be a bit too late. Then. Okay. And Jeremy? So your talk was very smooth and it washed over me beautifully, but I, I, I think I miss um, whether the rules, the pragmas, the inlines that you have to specify to inline a particular, uh, whether they're, they're specific to the type instance of the generic program that you're inlining, or whether those rules will work for any instances of the same generic function. They will work for any instances of the same generic function. However, for different functions, you might need different rewrite rules. Right. So the, the, but the, over data types, they, so the okay, I'm lying. they don't work for all data types, so that's because GHC has bugs. But um, <laughs> if, you, if you make your data type grow, then at some point it's working. Because, but this is a bug, and it's been filed, and it's going to be fixed. In principle, yes, it's data type or not. So but for each function, you might have to right. think so about the, it. In principle, the, the, the author of the generic function can write a sufficient set of rules that work for uh, yeah. all instances of the generic function. Yeah. Can I write it? So what I really liked about your presentation is you started off by saying, what would it take to prove that the um, specific function is equal to the generic function? And then actually by doing that proof, you learn which laws you needed in order to add the rewrite rules and which things should be in line. Exactly. And um, have you thought of uh, uh, applying this? And is that how you uh, is that how you work as well when you're trying to uh, figure out how to optimize these generic functions? After some time of trying other methods and failing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I sat down with a piece of paper and I said, "Okay, how would I do it?" Yeah. So, so have you thought of um, how you could, might be able to mechanize that, or if you, uh, for example, did it in a proof system that you can see exactly where definitions get unfolded and um, uh, which lemmas you need? Um, yeah, I think if if you're doing this in a dependently typed language or so, then um, <coughs> you could probably try to come up with a mechanism where your proofs are also your optimization strategy mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. um, but I've never no. tried anything this. But yeah, it's an interesting idea. Okay, that's the first question, I guess. Yeah. Uh, there's an algorithm of Shark Smitzes and Artem Anorin. Did you have a look at this? It yes. shows how you well, can do this for yeah. certain conditions. I think it's 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 very similar in a way. It's uh, the symbolic evaluation that's going on there. It's pretty much these optimizations that GHC has, like the cases. Uh, case of case, etc. Um, but that should work for almost any case, so if you would follow the algorithm that... Yeah, so I don't know, I think in, in, in that paper there is no... So enumeration is a tricky one, also because there is this diagonalization yeah. in between, yeah. right? So that's what forces us to have these three theorems coming up. I don't know how the algorithm... Um, the, how, how, what's, what's implemented in the thing, I don't know how that would work. Uh, yeah, well, we have one problem. I don't know if you're hit on the problem as well. Is we have a separate uh, compilation of modules. Mm. So that means if you well compile a module, you don't have all the source code available. Right. And since you can uh, define parts or specialized generic functions well, in any module, uh, we there have a problem. So, so as long as it's in one one thing, then uh, the compiler can get rid of it. In but GC, you, whenever you attach an inline fragment to something, no. he will he will put yes. on the uh, GC will put on the interface file the entire definition. So then the cross module thing is not a problem. Okay. Right. So. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much.